Hello, everybody. Thanks for watching. We are here today for the first panel discussion of the accompanying program of the current exhibition, Barabashi Lab Hidden Patterns. The exhibition investigates the patterns revealed through data and network science, among other things, in the medical field. Kicking off the program, Victoria Kulitza, Dirk Brockmann, Marta C. Gonzalez, and Albert Laszlo Barabashi will talk about the COVID-19 pandemic. In this panel, our four specialists will explain the pandemic's causes and effects and elaborate different containment strategies. So I would like to quickly introduce today's speakers. So the first of our speakers is more of an external host to this series than an actual guest, Albert Laszlo Barabashi. He is a physicist and the Robert Gray Dodge Professor of the Network Science, a distinguished university professor of physics and the director of the Center for Complex Network Research at Northeastern University. He also holds an appointment in the Department of Medicine at Harvard University and runs a European Research Council project at Central European University in Budapest, Hungary. He changed the course of modern science with his discovery of scale-free networks and therefore we show his work or the network visualizations of his university lab, the Barabashi lab at the moment in our museum, the ZKM Center for Art and Media in Karlsruhe. Amongst his most popular books are Linked, The Formula, Bursts, such as the award-winning award -winning textbooks, Network Science and Fractal Concepts in Surface Growth. So, um, thank you very much, Laszlo, for being here. Um, now I would like to welcome warmly our first guest, Dirk Brockmann. He is professor at the Institute of Biology at Humboldt University of Berlin. He was professor for applied mathematics at Northwestern University, where he was on the faculty of Northwestern Institute on Complex Systems, where he still holds an external faculty position. He is trained as a theoretical physicist and his research focuses on complex systems at the interface of physics, life sciences, and social sciences. Amongst other research topics, he is known for his work on human mobility and its role on the global spread of infectious diseases. Dirk Brockman is member of the Institute of Theoretical Biology, as well as the Integrated Research Institute for the Life Sciences at Humboldt University of Berlin. He is also head of the project group of computational epidemiology at the Robert Koch Institute German, of Germany's Federal Public Health Institute. So thank you very much for being here. And now a warm welcome also to Vittoria Kulitza. Um, Vittoria Kulitza is research director at the French National Institute for Health and Medical Research and the Sorbonne University in the Pierre-Louis Institute of Epidemiology and Public Health in France, um, in Paris. After a PhD in a theoretical physics, she worked at Indiana University and then joined ISAI Foundation in Turin, um, Italy. After being awarded an ERC starting grant in life sciences in 2007, in Paris, she currently leads the Epidemics in Complex Environments Lab, and her research focuses on human and animal epidemics to gather epidemic context awareness and provide risks assessment and analysis for preparedness, mitigation and control. Kulitza has been heavily involved in the COVID-19 health crisis and her work informed public health authorities in the different phases of the pandemic. Kulitza published over 100 papers in international peer-reviewed journals coordinated several national and European projects and received a number of awards. So warm welcome to her. And also a warm welcome to our last guest, um, Marta C. Gonzalez. Marta Gonzalez is an associate professor of city and regional planning at the University of California, Berkeley, and a physics research faculty in the energy technology area at the Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory. 
With the support of several cities and companies and foundations, her research team develops computer models to analyze digital traces of information mediated by devices. They process this information to manage the demand in urban infrastructures in relation to energy and mobility. Her recent research uses billions of mobile phone records to understand the appearance of traffic jams and the integration of electric vehicles into the grid. Marta Gonzalez also participates in the Scientific Council of Technology companies such as Grand Data, PTV, and the Pekin Street Project Consortium. Her mission is to put science and technology at the service of social well-being. So, thank you very much to all of you for being here. Now I would like to open the discussions with the first question. So I would like to address Vittoria Kulitsa with this question, which is very basic, and it's just about what is the role of the networks in epidemics? It's definitely a central role. We're thinking about epidemics of directly transmissible infectious diseases, meaning that we're thinking about a pathogen that can spread from one person to another. So in that context, there are at least two levels of in which, let's say, two frameworks, two phenomena in which networks are extremely important. The first one is really at the level of person-to-person -person interaction. So meaning when two persons are close enough or depending the type of transmission, if we're talking about COVID-19, it's a respiratory transmission. So we need to have two people close enough in terms of physical distance for the transmission to occur or within a closed uh, environment in which, for example, aerosol transmission can occur. So networks become central because we want to somehow identify those contexts in order then to be able to trace how the epidemic and the disease spreads from one person to another. If you look at a larger scale, then mobility becomes uh, again important. And there we have networks in terms of uh, uh, fluxes of uh, individuals who move from one location to another. And we started uh, with, uh, uh, with, with many years ago with the networks about air travel, but now thanks to the data that we have at disposal and Marta and Dirk are, uh, are, are of course pioneers in this area, we have high resolution data on mobility that really could help into understanding, anticipating, and also uh, tracking how instead the epidemic moves in space from one, for example, highly affected area to one that is not yet affected. Thank you very much. Maybe we could go um, one step back and actually talk about um, what mobility networks are and what specific role they do play. Maybe Marta, you could, could answer to this question. Sure. Mobility ne networks are the very appropriate representation of how a group of people move. Uh, then the nodes represent locations and the links represent travels. And they have different intensity depending on the number of people traveling link from A to B. A very convenient aspect of networks to represent mobility is that you can uh, have the different scales associated with the phenomena. For example, the nodes can be cities, as Victoria said, uh, from travel uh, patterns. But once uh, the epidemic starts, let's say, in the Bay Area, then the nodes can be counties from San Francisco to Palo Alto. There is a mobility. Interesting enough, thanks to the data available today, we can even map the mobility at a, within a city. For example, within Berkeley, we can go from census block to census block. And all this data is being shared today to represent the mobility network and help us uh, work in the problem we're facing today. Um, of course, um, in the show that Laszlo did with his lab, the Barabashi lab at the ZKM, we are also showing um, mobility networks. So uh, maybe Laszlo also wants to continue on this and maybe show some images. Sure, absolutely. And uh, uh, I'm kind of delighted, first of all, that ZKM has taken on the, uh, the possibility to really show some of these network representations in such a prestigious museum, as well as kind of even to devote a room to mobility, as well as potentially the spreading. And I want to emphasize actually here that 
there has been really a revolution happening in kind of in the last 10 years in terms of uh, modeling epidemic spreading. And so when, to some degree, when the COVID arrived, there was an exceptionally prepared small group of people like Dirk, like uh, Victoria, like Marta, who had the tools ready to kind of tackle that problem. And really, as a result, the epidemic didn't come unwarned. We knew that it's happening. And when actually policymakers started to take seriously the dangers of the epidemic, there were actually professional answers of how it would spread and where do we need to intervene. The exhibit is not trying to actually address all this whole scope of the problem. Uh, and I'm sure we're gonna discuss some of it during the talk, but it just focuses on some of the visualizations that we have done in the last uh, kind of 20 years in the lab. And, and for the sake of concreteness, I'm showing you here a couple of images from the exhibit. One of them actually, what you see here is a work of Marta when she was back then in our lab. And, uh, and we were for the first time kind of started to use mobile phone data to explore the mobility of individuals in, the sp uh, in space. And we have to realize this, we're talking about 2000 to 2003. This was way before, you know, kind of uh, our, uh, the current use of mobile phones. We didn't have smartphones. We just had actually real kind of like, you know, that, uh, that uh, large or small phones that we would carry around. But it was that time when people were kind of realizing that human mobility could be actually tracked thanks to the devices that we all carry, carry along. So this was actually one of the first visualizations we did in this space where we're trying to show for one particular individual, two different individuals motion, trying to illustrate that some people are very, very regular, like the individual on the left, and other people are much less regular and they kind of cover a large area both in space and time and kind of in interact with many, many people. And obviously from the spreading perspective, from the virus spreading perspective, we do realize how much more impact the right individual could have if he or she is infected compared to the, the left one. But this was not the only work we did in this space, but I should also say that this work was inspired by the work of Dirk who actually before us has used mobile, uh, uh, I mean, the dollar bills to track the mobility of the individuals. So when we got access to the mobile phone data, we realized that that idea that he kind of explored there could be explored much more accurately knowing, uh, you know, the, the mobility through mobile phones. But uh, we, we also, and let me jump actually to something that is even more relevant today, which are these visualizations. Again, something that part of us part of, which is uh, back 10 years ago, we tried to ask the question, what happens if a particular hypothetical virus starts from a certain region of the space, one particular individual gets infected, and that virus only spread through direct contacts. And how would that actually spread in space? And what you see here is a temporal evolution of how the virus is infecting more and more individuals in space. The, diff the lattice corresponds to what we call the Voronoi lattice, the local regions where, where the, uh, the phone reception is, assigned, uh, is connected to a particular mobile phone tower. And the colors correspond to how many people have been infected in time in the, at a given moment uh, 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 in that particular location. And what you see here, and the reason why I think this is interesting to see in the museum, is that you see kind of the COVID 10 years earlier, right? You see the, the, the type of images that we became so accustomed to these days, uh, to, be, to exploring uh, thanks to the COVID, where, and, and kind of what the, the visual language that we use today kind of uh, uh, that, that, uh, that everybody became used to fancy newspapers, websites, and so on, was kind of developed 10, 15 years earlier, thanks to the work of Dirk, thanks to the work of Marta, thanks to the work of uh, Victoria, and many other network scientists who way before COVID recognized that re this may be actually a major issue and we need the tools to address it. So and maybe one interesting um, point about the mobility networks would be also um, what you guys think um, did these um, predictions um, acti actively do? Did they actively support policymaking and public warning systems? 
So maybe, um, Dirk Brockmann, this is a good question to you, as you yes. are an advisor in Germany and also, of course, abroad. I could, I could answer that question, and I will in a second. But um, while Laszlo was showing these uh, pieces of art, I was in my head coming back to the questions what networks do in epidemics. And I, I, I want to add two things. And two things that I've experienced in, in this job of you know, working at a public health institute and also advising policymakers in the COVID crisis. And one of the things is, um, you know, you can explain clearly that, you know, contact networks between individuals are important. And you can also convey that mobility networks are important, like the air transportation network, for instance, or the networks that Laszlo uh, mentioned. But uh, the issue really is, or like the value in network science in this field, in the way I see it, is that it's almost like the what the microscope is for microbiology or the telescope for astrophysics. Because networks, when you visualize them, make you see things. It's not only that, you know, the realization that, ah, you know, it's contact networks. Oh, it's a mobility network. But having shown network data or network structures like contact networks or mobility networks to people that un understand epidemiology, that's when the value comes in. It's suddenly they see stuff. They see structure. It's like when first people looked through the microscope, they saw stuff they hadn't seen before. The secret of network science to me, or like a, a, a major component of it is it makes things visible. It doesn't really, it, often it's quantitative, like the, you calculate stuff, you know, many of us came from physics or, or math and, or, you know, computer science. But to me, many times in my past, when I looked at a network for the first time, immediately I saw stuff. And then I went deeper into it. So it's really almost like an instrument. Um, the science itself, it's an instrument of seeing things. And coming back to your question in terms of like advising uh, epidemiologists or policymakers, one of the challenges that still exists is that many of the people that are traditionally responsible for dealing with the, the COVID crisis or epidemics, they don't have these tools. They have never, like using that metaphor, looked through a microscope. They have never looked through a situation through network science. And so, you know, whenever they do, that's excellent because they start seeing things and they start understanding structural things in the networks that they may have something to do with the dynamics of the pandemic. For instance, just an example, I'm sure this was the case in many countries. In der Germany, there was a long discussion of where infections may occur. Is it the workplace? Is it the school? Is it, you know, in the subway or... It was unknown initially, and it's still to some extent quite unknown. And so then people started looking at, for instance, the networks between students in the school and the families, which is another network. And these family members, they go to work, which forms another network. So there are all these structures. And the clue is, you know, looking at these structures and then understanding, you know, where do you want to go with your vaccination campaign? Where do you want to go testing? So it's really... The power of this is in making structures visually available because if you come down to it, eye inspection is probably the most successful scientific tool of all time. You know, it's the combination of our hands and the eyes, but we see amazingly well structures. And so that's, you know, wrapping up this 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 answer to your questions in terms of like, how much does it play a role in understanding the pandemic and advising people when you use it? And I've done this in the past. And often I have showed it to individuals that have never experts that have never seen a network before in a sense. Um, it made much sense to them or it helped them amazingly. On the downside, there's still a lot of room you know, there's a lot, still a lot of room for development for, for instance, integrating the network science into these fields as sort of a 
one of the most powerful tools that you can have concerning human behavior, etc. So uh, it's still in a in a in a scientific culture that is very divided into disciplines and experts. Uh, it's very hard to you know come in with a new way of looking at things. So that's kind of my longish, almost philosophical answer to your question. But if I may jump in for a mm -hmm. second, I think one of the reasons I find the Zekheim show is so important for kind of putting this exhibit up is because as Dirk said, the key here is to bring these, these networks alive. And let's not forget that the title of the exhibit is Hidden Patterns. And what network science has brought to both epidemiology as well as to kind of uh, policy making in general is making the invisible visible, right? Yes. And bringing out these hidden connections that are causal and consequential, consequential for the way the viruses are spreading. And, but we had no way of before visualizing them. And, and at the same time, the network science community has not only contributed greatly to develop these network epidemic tools and all these people around the table and many others, but also they have pioneered how to visualize this and how to actually kind of bring this home to both to the scientists and eventually to the public at large. And in that respect, Dirk, I'm hoping you're going to show some of the images that you did that were very, very influential even for me about how the epidemics are spreading. I can do that uh, if, I, if I can just inject this at the moment. I had uh, two things prepared, so I'm going to share my screen real quick. Uh, and they kind of go along the line of um, of just showing stuff. Uh, and it's quite simple. You should see like this rotating earth now. This is, uh, it's quite simple. It's just the global air transportation network visualized in a certain way. And it's only done for one purpose. It's done for the purpose of illustrating how connected we are nowadays. And that has an impact. Even if I cannot predict, you know, very precisely how a pandemic like COVID would spread across the globe, which is also quite possible. Um, it's just, you know, it transports the intuition to laymen or, you know, traditional epidemiologists to what we expect or should expect in a globally connected world. Or uh, here's another example, this goes back. It's also a network science idea of revealing hidden patterns which become visible when you do a little bit of network science. This is a, a, an illustration of the map and there's part of the air transportation sh network shown here. And one of the things we did, this is already also like almost 10 years ago, we figured maybe, you know, in this connected world, distance, traditional distance, traditional maps like this one are not the most intuitive way of looking at things anymore. And instead, we should, you know, redefine the notion of distance using network signs, such that, you know, places that are connected by lots of traffic, they're closer together. There's a little bit of, you know, math underneath there, but it's essentially this is true. And when you look at like a place like Wuhan, where the COVID came from, this is like the central node, you can use network science to kind of get an idea how it would spread across the globe. And if it were like, you know, in some, some other, you know, place like Beijing, you can kind of select a different place here. And this restructures itself. And then you can see in this radial, radial pattern how a virus would spread that originates at a certain location. This is just one example of how network science can help, illustrating again the fact that also Laszlo mentioned how you can use network science like this methods and the mathematics and the theory behind it connected to visualizations and then you make things that, you know, visible that, you know, initially uh, were not. And so that's like one of the examples that I wanted to present here where this works. And there are countless other examples of, 
of this sort of kind of philosophy, how network science makes things visible, like Lasso mentioned. Mm -hmm. So maybe I'm still um, looking at the network, um, which I, I think you were once calling the effective distance. Right. right. So um, what were, would you say, the, the key effective distance routes that were responsible for the spreading of the C19 virus ah. in the beginning of the pandemic? Yeah, so when we did this, this is like more than, this was like early in February 2020 when we started applying this for the spread of uh, the virus from uh, mainland China to many other areas. And it was clear, it, it helped us actually, you know, in a situation where like in Germany, there were no cases uh, and, you know, everyone was kind of expecting this to happen at some point. This was then used to get an idea of, you know, is it going to get to, you know, Frankfurt earlier than to London or to Paris or Rome, this sort of information was very valuable at that point. And then, you know, this is, you know, one example of a tool that was essential in the beginning of the pandemic. It's no longer used now, although we now reuse it again because of the new variants that emerge in some places. And, you know, everyone wants to know if there's a new variant appearing somewhere in the world, when is it going to get to Europe or to the Americas or, Uh, to other places in the world. So it's really also like more of a very, very effective tool of sharpening your intuition about what's going to happen. Mm -hmm. Often it's misunderstood that these models that modelers develop all over the world are designed in a fashion to make precise predictions quantitatively. Often they're criticized Mm -hmm. for not being able to do that but it's more you know about getting an idea of what's going to happen all, also on a qualitative way mm -hmm. or on a different level sort of on a holistic way i should add to that actually interestingly that uh, as kind of uh, witnessing these developments i happen to be in the network science institute and my colleague is alessandro vespiani that everybody else knows around the table And he's been warning me and everybody in the Institute since December 2019 that there'll be a major problem coming with COVID. Yeah. And I remember at the end of January when I returned, as many of us from the NETSAI meeting in Japan, he was like very concrete about the predictions. Mm -hmm. And I'm assuming that he wasn't alone, right? And the tools were ready actually to make those predictions and the data was available. It was the policymakers who were not ready to really kind of act on those uh, type of data. I was wondering yeah, yeah. whether that type of knowledge was obvious only to us because I was close to that or maybe we're in the US or was it known already in France, say to Victoria or no, was, was it in Germany? It was exactly the same situation, Laszlo. Uh, it was mid-January that we alerted uh, first alerted the authorities about the risk of importations. Uh, um, and again, as you as you said, this was possible because of 10, 15 years of work uh, and because the data was available, because the tools were there, because we knew how to work on them. And so very rapidly, we were able to alert on the differential risk of importation in uh, different countries in Europe. And at that time, authorities were just making statements about absence of COVID that, that were protected. Uh, and there was the, the big decision, a big uh, debate uh, in Europe around uh, possibly closing and shutting down airports, uh, closing connection exclusively with China, uh, etc. And we knew also in that respect, again, for about 10 years of work on the use of travel restrictions, uh, what is their role? I think one thing that surprised us was uh, the complete travel ban in uh, uh, in Wuhan at the very beginning. That then, of course, uh, a couple of months after was followed by by uh, the, the big lockdowns in several countries all over the world. But at that, that time, in, uh, in the second half of January, that was something that we were not expecting. But it was clear to us already that given the importations around the world, uh, the virus was already escaped out of China. And so there was really... Uh, Uh, a, a pandemic risk uh, very concrete and much before the alert uh, by, by the international authorities like WHO. I think uh, going back to the qualitative versus quantitative, I think that both aspects are extremely important. On one side, uh, these data and these tools allow you to have uh, an insight 
into what is going to happen and how it is going to happen. For example, ranking who are the countries at the highest risk of importation. And typically this, uh, this prediction are also quite well respected uh, when you look at the phenomenon of spreading. Again, these were not only tools that were developed in the past and that they've also been tested uh, for a long time. Uh, they were developed after SARS outbreak. So they were not used during that outbreak, but they were retrospectively validated over SARS outbreak. And then in real time, they've been used, for example, during the 2009 H1N1 pandemic, they were used for Zika virus epidemic, they were used for Ebola when spread and through and led to some importation across the world. And they were used also for MERS uh, COVID epidemic, which is another coronavirus. And in that situation, it was also more probably more difficult for some aspect specific to the disease. But then they also become and not only in preparation for, well, for, for Europe, we did a work, it was the, again, we started, it was the end of January 2020, and it was about importation in Africa. Um, and, and again, because uh, the traffic, when we, when we were thinking about previous pandemic and we were thinking about SARS epidemic in particular, and at that time, the connections between China and Africa were very uh, much more limited with respect to what we have now because of increased uh, collaborations on the business level, increased travel, increased exchange of students. And, and Africa was uh, somehow was looked at at a possible problem uh, at the end of January, especially because of a lack of resources. So resources in terms of um, measures to put at the airport, but also very basic resources in terms of how many, uh, for example, uh, centers can do tests in order to identify whether COVID has arrived. So in Europe, anyway, we had quite a large availability, which was poor compared to now, but we had the possibility to understand given the resources, whether, for example, a person who was symptomatic going to the hospital, whether it was affected from COVID. And in, in Africa at that time, there, was, there were only two labs for the entire continent. And so looking at the importation risk and then looking at other indicators on uh, the ability to respond to an epidemic on the uh, capacity that either each country had, we were able to identify countries, for example, that were at, with high capacity, and so they were probably less concerning in terms of dealing with importations, and then countries with moderate capacity, which had instead a large variety uh, of values in terms of their risk of early importation. And this was used by authorities in order to identify where to intensify, for example, testing capacities, testing abilities, where to bring resources uh, through, mainly through WHO and collaborating countries uh, to, to build up this capacity that was inevitably needed. And then we saw that that was only the very start of the pandemic. So what I would find really interesting about what you all said is um, like in the beginning of the pandemic, I mean, kind of Laszlo already said that you were aware of the fact that there's this big crisis coming up and nobody else did know in that time. So did you kind of like meet up or, you know, speak to each other more recently in that time? I, I can answer that. Um... So as far as I remember, and it's been so long, it feels like, uh, the, you know, many of the people in the community that we're connected in talk to one another. But it was not only us, you know, obviously some people that have been exposed to this line of work and this line of thinking, they saw this also coming. For instance, people that, uh, you know, started sequencing data, etc. And um, but one of the things like Victoria said is um, the conviction that this was going to be a big problem and could not be contained in China is really a an insight that was gained from a lot of papers that were done 10, 15 years ago where people like Victoria, Alex Vespignani, Martha, and many others, so essentially like a handful of people, not so many. 
started asking, you know, how fast does something spread on a network, like a, an air transportation network or within a country? And I can tell you that some people that have not been exposed to these results that this cannot be contained and you cannot contain it if you reduce air traffic by 90% or whatever. The, the structural properties of these networks are such that you cannot contain it unless you just remove the entire network or something. Many people still and still do, especially people that are trained in medical science, some, I've, they, they think as this, as you know, a wave that you can contain by putting a wall somewhere or by, you know, isolating people and protecting them, etc. Not understanding this combination of this dangerous sort of exponential growth that is inherent in an epidemic and the network structure on which this unfolds. One time I tried to convince people in policy that, you know, there's this one, one aspect that you cannot contain it if there's a network and it just goes. The other aspect is that like Vittoria said, that, you know, at the end of the day, it's our contact networks that sustain it. I made that sort of transparent in, 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 a, in, a, in an interview where I said, the virus eats our contacts. You know, our contacts are the food for the virus. Because the people that I had to convince, they did not think about it this way. They thought about the pandemic sort of like, a, like the image that they had in their head was like a poisonous gas that like, comes down like acid rain or something like this. And you have to like put something over your head in order to protect yourself. But it's the contact networks that sustain it. And it's our decision what kind of contacts we make. And one of the things where this falls back onto network science is that it becomes, and that's where I see a lot of you know, open questions also, as the pandemic unfolded, and people developed fear and you know containment measures were taken, there was lockdown, we changed our behavior. And that changed our contact networks. And that changed the dynamics of the pandemic. And then people we you know changed their networks again. So this kind of feedback of these, you know, these dynamic contact networks, it's essentially not known what's what's going on. But um, you know, it's it's one of the you know, one of the biggest insights to me was that, and that was already known before this thing took off. Like, you know, the, the impact of changing contact networks on disease dynamics. There were lo lots of information was available. The thing is, at least in Germany, I can say that, it was not available to those that are traditionally responsible for, for dealing with a situation like this. It's unknown. They're very open, they're very smart, but they just don't know these things. And they've never been exposed. And that is because of the, you know, the scientific culture of, you know, very deep gaps between very specified scientific disciplines. And network, if network science is one thing, it's almost like a network that connects different disciplines. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, it's another aspect of it, I think. And if that's lacking, like add, it's an issue. I would like to add a discipline that is uh, different from epidemiology, that is city planning. And uh, from the, that angle, uh, they are being asked on policies, and the, we are seeing an opportunity uh, in the sense that we got used to not having to all go together to work and be suffering the traffic jams. Mm -hmm. Then uh, we also were used to, um, no, we were forced to, to have open spaces for the restaurants and we would not like to be all, crap, uh, all crowded in the, in, the, in the transit system. Then the type of uh, policy that has been uh, developing uh, post pandemic is how we use uh, open spaces and it has been an opportunity to plan for bike path, 
in Bogota, for example, the, the World Bank and the city are totally open to, to this uh, type of measurements that, again, has been informed in city planning using transportation tools. This is one more example. And I'm glad you mentioned that, Marta, because what you said and what Dirk said is actually very nicely illustrated in the exhibit itself. And if I sh may share screen again to show you one of the works uh, that we have there that we explicitly wanted to be, we were inspired by Marta's work on human mobility using mobile phones. So we use mobile phone data to see how people in New York City changed their behavior as the pandemic was approaching. And what you see actually, these two New York City kind of like a long inflating and the, the inflation corresponds to how many people are found in a given day in the city. And what you see here is the number of people in the city and what as and as we're approaching kind of the March, uh, kind of end of March, you see that there is a self-imposed quarantine by people, less and less people showing up at the city and the, and the city is kind of being more and more collapsed. And this is volunteer based because there was no official lockdown at this point in New York City, right? So that week is a total anomaly. And the official lockdown kind of comes there at this moment when pretty much the city collapses as everybody seems to be frozen. And what is interesting about the changing human behavior is that a new normal has emerged, right? And that, that is that now there is still the daily motion of people coming into the city and leaving the essential personnel, those who cannot actually stay home, but they do so at a much lower volume. And that kind of connects to both what Dirk said, that, that one, of the predict, one of the challenges of predictions that this is not purely about how the virus spreads, but also how humans react to it, right? And, and what kind of changes we make in our behavior, as well as Marta was saying, is that how the COVID has fundamentally changed the way we behave, the way we commute, the way we work, the way we go to work. And, and in a way, this work, we, act, we named it the, my 21st century, because I personally believe that the 21st century started here, kind of at the end of March. Uh, because in the same way that we don't remember what happened before the First World War in the 19th century, unless you are a historian, I think we're going to find generations later that it will be hard to remember what happened before the COVID, but COVID will be such a defining moment in the life of this and maybe one or two generations after, uh, after us. And it's all about not only how the viruses are spread, but how do we react and how do we kind of alter our daily behavior? And that's where the challenge and the kind of the recent challenge of the modeling that, that uh, Dirk and uh, Victoria and Marta were doing is not only to look at the virus, but also to factor in the human behavior. And I'd be curious, Marta, have you guys kind of gone back to the mobile data and kind of revisit prediction power using mobile phones now? Uh, uh, because given the fact that that gives the most accurate description of what happens on the street level. We have been seeing how uh, one country, several cities at a time, how the mobility, similar to what you are showing nicely in that visualization in New York, we have seen only uh, measurements of mobility before all the cities go down then slowly start coming up again. And what is nice is that they are not, the epidemic uh, capability doesn't go as uh, higher because the protection, the personal protection uh, mechanisms. So it's two factors now to add into the are not prediction. That is both mobility and the behavior of using your uh, personal mask uh, protections. That is the type of things that is always uh, qualitatively mobility matters. And then there is complexities in reaching the quantitative uh, behavior of the, of the epidemic. That, that is what we are working now. And one of the interesting application is, okay, people is going back to move and we need to live with that to recover the economy. Then the research questions are, which type of jobs uh, would be more vulnerable than others? So it's another aspect of uh, the powerful aspect, uh, 
the powerful tool that this uh, network research represents. And there are already a lot of discussion now entering this uh, this fall. Uh, uh, well, in, in Europe, things are start a bit later than, than the US. So they're coming up uh, around this time when schools reopen and people go back to work after the summer break uh, about what are the conditions to be imposed or suggested or recommended on smart working, how many days per week. And notably, uh, Southern Europe has not been among the uh, regions uh, in the world with the highest percentage of smart working before the pandemic. So this was really a, a shock bringing a, a completely changing the habits of individuals, the habits of, uh, of the place of work, of workplaces, and of course, then of people who need to manage then human resources, etc. And nowadays, we're, we're still, anyway, going through uh, here in Europe, uh, a wave of Delta that seems uh, for the moment uh, um, mitigated by the use, for example, of sanitary passes, but with the reopening uh, of schools and the going back to school and going back to work, uh, the number, for example, of days, how we're going to manage uh, smart working and uh, what legislation needs to be applied how this needs to be changing, what are the, uh, the, the, the somehow the desires, for example, of younger generation who, who desire more flexibility and up to now that they, they were not able to have it and the pandemic offered this opportunity, but at the same time, of course, the missing all the social aspects uh, related to meeting each other uh, at, the, at, at the work. And so this is one of the central aspects of how we're going to rearrange our daily lives life now after this large shock that uh, that hit us so but um if i understood that right and um, Marta, you are actually working kind of in long-term containment strategies right so you are kind of thinking um about the future how um urban spaces can change so the mobility networks it's say itself have to change because you know we do not move so closely to each other anymore. Correct. Mm -hmm. The use of the space in the city is uh, with this new normal. Okay. Great. So um, I have another question that goes a bit in a different direction, maybe. <laughs> so um, actually, because of the fact that people today live in close proximity and also close to animals, was the reason also um, or yeah, where COVID is supposed to have originated. And what do you think? Are there ideas for using network theory in order to help organize the coexistence of humans and animals? Something like warning maps that show the distances between animal sheds and human housing that are critical, for example? I don't know who wants to answer. Maybe Dirk, maybe Marta. While I'm thinking about the question, to which I have no answer, um, I'm, I can speculate. I mean, obviously, you know, there's a combination of things happening. That combination of things might change because of COVID, like, you know, because of what Marta uh, and Vitoria said and what, what Laszlo showed, like the beginning of the 21st century, like after the dip and sort of the... Uh, the long lasting persistent changes that were induced by the COVID pandemic. It is, you know, it, it's hard to say knowing that, you know, we have an exponentially growing human population. We, we live in more and more urban settings and we eat lots of animals that, you know, the likelihood of emergence is just going to increase. You know, that's known to everyone using network science to like look into this in a bit deeper way hard for me to imagine at the moment although i'm sure there might be possibilities um of doing it um but given that you know the the you know the the greatest potential that i see in terms of like applications of network science and sort of this post covid era is really trying to understand what COVID did to our networks and in particular to our contact networks. Because there are so many areas of contact networks, you know, there are networks on which we exchange information. 
their proximity networks, you know, the sort of daily, the patterns that Laszlo showed, like the regular patterns on which we commute to work or the patterns that generate sort of the pulse of Manhattan. And then there are other types of networks, you know, mixing networks, et cetera. And, and all of these have changed. You know, we, we're not in one room at the moment. You know, we, uh, we video conference, which is the new normal. You know, I teach my courses this way and some of this may last. And so, you know, I'm, I'd be quite curious to see, you know, in what way networks have changed and how to, you know, how this impacts disease dynamics in general, because it has an impact on other diseases that like spread all the time, you know, influenza and other diseases. And so to me, the big insight is like on a, on a very sort of general bird's eye perspective, how do these networks that connect individuals change over time? And how does that shape processes that occur on these networks? And um, I don't see at the moment like a connection to like our coexistence with animals that we eat. Um, but you know, I'm, I'm sure there's there's thoughts about that. I, I just don't have any at the moment. From the data perspective, the urban rural rural urban rural a connection can be mapped. And I think the difficulty there is the nature of the virus. Victoria, do you have a a yeah. word on that, right? No, but, but indeed you're right. So I think that for, for the moment, people have studied in uh, layers separately. So what Marta is saying, a urban rural connection, and then epidemiologists have been mostly working, for example, on hotspot maps, identifying, for example, risks. And typically this has been done for, for vectors. So we know already about the viruses. We know that this is not an emergent virus. We know where they are located, what kind of vectors they, um, uh, what kind of vectors they are present, and also in what regions and areas these vectors uh, find that they are, uh, can be established. And so I think one of the next steps clearly is putting this connection between these layers of presence of vectors and these layers of human mobility and exposure, because they will bring us more information um, and additional insight on what is the risk of exposures of humans and also what is the risk then of bringing these vectors to other areas so where they could be fit. Uh, we think about Zika, Zika was mainly in the Pacific area and then at a certain point uh, moved and found a, a completely new habitat where it got established with of course uh, um, a very large impact. And so this may happen again concerning new emerging viruses directly transmitted as COVID-19. I think that the big one of the big issues is of course this interface. You Human animal. The large majority of, our, of pathogens come from animals. And one of the big issues is deforestation. Uh, so once again, these, because it offers somehow, it, uh, it offers immediate uh, contact uh, between uh, humans and animals, which were simply unreachable uh, in presence of, of forests. So this is what, what epidemiologists are, are, and ecologists are arguing uh, for in terms of control. So trying to reduce, uh, drastically reduce deforestation around the world in order also to reduce these opportunities. Uh, COVID-19 surely will, will uh, uh, especially with, with also all uh, the questions and issues and debate around its origin will inevitably spur a lot of activities going into new surveillance, going to, into probably also uh, these needs to uh, counteract uh, activity, human activities of, uh, of the last few years, and then exposures. And, and exposures need to be re-evaluated, of course, also in light of uh, uh, the climate change where uh, habitats uh, for uh, animals, vectors, and humans are rapidly, quite rapidly evolving, and so they will have an impact in the in the next decades as well. Okay, but it sounds like it would be an important project for the future. <laughs> okay, so um, thank you so much. Um, so maybe um, I should follow up with um, a last question, um, which regards kind of the um, current situation. 
So there have been only very few cases of death of vaccinated people that were infected. And also um, generally people tend to move less internationally. So given these facts and the reliability of the vaccines, what is your prognosis for the future? And for this kind of last questions, I would really like everybody to give a short answer, maybe just in a few sentences only. <laughs> Thank you. You go first if you want. Um, Great. This is going to occupy us for some years. That's my prognosis. Just even if the vaccines are very effective, um, it could, the vaccine uptake is very heterogeneous. There are many areas in the world where vaccines are unavailable. And there are lots, there's lots of virus around, and there are going to be new variants, etc. So it's just going to occupy us for a long time. That's my my gut feeling about this. And I, I can just, you know, I agree 100% with that, what Dirk said. Let me ask, let me add this only that uh, we will need to use uh, uh, preventive measures, continue using preventive measures, uh, even in presence of the vaccine, even when uh, vaccination is, uh, has a large coverage. Um, variants, I mean, 2021 20, has clearly shown in these few months that variants can completely change uh, once again the epidemiology and we haven't yet encountered um, large uh, circulation of variants that, that have a strong immune escape against the either natural infection or vaccine uh, immunity and and this will is, is probably the, like the most important concern. And one of the, of the things that we don't know yet um, is, is also the, the impact that long COVID will have. So the long consequences uh, that this is found around 10, 15% in adults, about seven, eight percent in children. Of course, due to, I mean, we don't have enough uh, um, historical, uh, let's say, uh, time window in order to appreciate exactly how this is going to evolve. But once again, having a new virus, uh, uh, these are all important aspects that could uh, impact, uh, sense, substantially impact our daily life uh, uh, in the next year to come, even once we protect from, from severe diseases, which was the main objective of the vaccine. So I think there was still a lot, a lot to roll and uh, the global, globally heterogeneous situation is probably one of the next uh, uh, big aspect that will define uh, the, the upcoming months. From my angle, that is urban planning and mobility, I'm hopeful that we learn as a society to uh, use, reuse the uh, spaces in cities and our time in work in such a way that uh, we really learn how to uh, slow down the spreading in our cities. Well, I think it's very interesting what's happening because as Dirk said, uh, and Victoria too, COVID will stay with us, particularly with the scientific community for a long time, because this has been the first epidemic that has been totally recorded in every aspect of it. And there is such an amount of data collected in such a heterogeneous way across different countries, different decisions, that I believe that COVID will become the E. coli actually of epidemiology for many, many years to come. But regarding the current situation, I think let us not forget that despite of all the uh, other uh, news, what we see right now is mainly an epidemic of the unvaccinated, right? And of course, there is, there is a tendency to focus on breakthrough infections, people who got the vaccine and got infected. The numbers are very small, the cases are very mild. And what we're seeing worldwide is really the spread of the virus among those who could not get the, uh, the vaccine or chose not to get the vaccine. Mm -hmm. And why is that happening? That was kind of expected to the community that we're gonna, be, we're gonna fight the, uh, the vaccine war. And that's where I think that, for example, this museum exhibit has an important role. And in general, not only scientists have to play a role and policymakers, but the society as large, right? Because we need to educate ourselves and the public about what are the mechanisms through which viruses are spreading and what are the mechanisms through which we can actually stop them? And network science has, is a field that's been around now more than 20 years. 
but it has been a niche field. And I think what has happened during the COVID is that it really became in the forefront where everyone became a little bit of network epidemiologist, where at the dinner table, the discussion was not as much the latest uh, uh, movie, but it was about what is the reproduction rate of the virus in my neighborhood and, and how, what is the role of the social contact of mobility. This is a game changer. It's a game changer for network thinking. It's a game changer for network science. And it's a game changer for the society's ability to educate themselves through exhibits like the ZKIM and other sources and to be much more prepared for the next pandemic. Thank you very much. Um, even though, if not everything you say, said makes me happy right now. <laughs> but yeah. We are looking into a very interesting future and um, I hope that you enjoyed um, the conversation as, as much as I did and um, I wish you a nice evening and thank you very much and a special thanks to Marta because on her end it's very very early. <laughs> thank you very much that you made it. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thanks. So um, I just wanted um, to let you know about um, the upcoming um, series of this, these panel discussions. So um, on October 7, we will have the discussion on biological networks and the participants are the artist Thomas Saraceno, Georgi Bushaki from the NYU, Corinna Alhoff from the University of Tübingen, and Alice Schwarze um, from the Department of Biology at the University of Washington. Then the next episode will be on November the 4th, and it's called Data Reflection and Design. And the participants are the artist Kim Albrecht, the artist Matthew Ritchie, um, then the, the researcher and professor Wendy Chun from the Simon Fraser University, and then also the um, information designer, Georgia Lupi. So our last confirmed date is on the 2nd um, of December and it's on art networks. And the participants for now are Albert Laszlo Barabashi and then also Maximilian Schich from the University um, of Texas. Then also we will have um, an upcoming event, actually a symposium, um, but all of that you will find on the website later on. So thank you for watching us again um, and all the best. Bye.